Strengthen us and grow us, Father, that we would continue to have a desire to walk in your Spirit. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be prepared today, our minds would be ready to receive, our ears would be clear and open. God, I pray that we would look through this text today and be ready to pull out what you have for us. And so through that, I pray that I'm not a distraction, that I'm I'm not seen nor heard, but that you alone are seen and heard, Father, and that you alone would get all of the honor, glory, credit, and praise. Father, we acknowledge as your people that you have all power to do whatever you want to do within our lives and within this ministry. And so, Father, you do that. And I pray that our hearts would be such that we would be obedient to do whatever you call and faithful to follow through by your strength, not ours. In Jesus' name and blood, everybody said together. Amen and amen. To God be the glory. Amen. To God be the glory. Turn in your Bibles, please, if you will, church, to Daniel chapter 6, verse 3. I I read a couple of these verses to to the men's group a couple weeks ago, and I want to swing back around and just go a little deeper with, with the family here. And to a degree, a lot is this. A lot of this is what I was able to uh, to preach to the to the Mexican people. I'm excited to share it with you. Daniel chapter six, verse three. And this is what the Word of God says. If you do not have a Bible with you, look onto the screens, and you'll you'll see it there. Daniel chapter six, beginning with the third verse. The Word of God says this. Praise the Lord. Then, then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent, what church? Spirit. What kind of spirit was it? It was excellent. How many people in here have a desire to be excellent in your life? At all that you do, in your marriage, uh, at work, at home, in your friendships. But listen to this, how about in your relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Excellence. Right? Nobody, nobody in their right mind woke up this morning and said, yes, it's a new day. I hope I'm a complete failure. I just hope everything I do fails today. I just hope this day stinks some kind of bad. I'm so looking forward to a bad day. Oh. Excellence, right? Every one of us should have a strive, should have a drive for excellence. So look at the third verse again. Daniel chapter 6 verse 3 says this. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. Now, is that a, that word spirit, is that a capital S or is that a lowercase s? And so whose spirit is it talking about, God or his? It's talking about his spirit. All right, so I want you to understand that. This we, we're not just going to say, yeah, 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 God, God is excellent and his spirit is in us and so there's an excellent spirit. No, no, no. It's talking about the spirit of Daniel. And so listen to this. If Daniel's spirit was excellent, then that means every one of us in this room today have an opportunity where we too can claim an excellent spirit. Or we can be excellent amongst ourselves. Excellence. How many people know that excellence is what God requires of us? He says, be holy for what? I am holy. And that's a charge. He says, you be holy. You be holy for I'm holy. And so he wants no less than excellence. How many people in here raise children or you're raising children and you wanted excellence from your children? Right? How many people got married and you expected excellence from your spouse? Right? Okay. Excellence! When God sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross... That was excellence. When Jesus accepted the will of his Father, that was excellence. Doing what needed to be done even when it wasn't popular, that's excellence. Being obedient when we don't understand why we're being obedient, that's excellence. Doing when told when we don't know the outcome, that's excellence. Leaving the old lifestyle behind, and maybe that includes people as well so that you can continue to move forwards. That's excellence. Listen, there's not a group in this world, there's not a friend that would be so good to me that I would allow hang so close to me that he would pull me into hell rather than walk me into heaven. Somebody like that is not worth associating with. 
Now, that doesn't mean that we don't minister to the unsaved. That doesn't mean that we don't love the unsaved. That doesn't mean that we don't spend time with the unsaved. That doesn't mean that that we don't uh, provide things to show the love of Christ to the unsaved. We're to do all of that to the unchurched. Amen? But we must not be able to get to a point to where we're no longer excellent because of them. You understand? You know, in in, in Jude, uh, there's, there's only one chapter in the book of Jude. It says that we're to snatch people from the flames of hell. In other words, I'm to go all the way to bring them back. But if they don't come back, I refuse to go with them. You understand? Nobody's worth that. So look at, look at uh, Daniel chapter 6, verse 3. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. Now because of this excellent spirit, watch what happens. Verse 3 says, and the king planned to sit him over the what? So the king, okay, who is not Jewish, plans to sit Daniel over his entire kingdom. You say, what kind of sense does that make if you knew anything about the backstory here? Uh, go to Daniel chapter 1 with me. And I want to show you why Daniel had an excellent spirit. Daniel chapter 1. We're going to begin church with the 8th verse. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. The Word of God says this, praise the Lord. But, and if you've got subtitles in your Bible, uh, some of them may be different. Most of them are going to be about the same theme. Uh, the subtitle for this uh, part of the text is Daniel's what? Faithfulness. Daniel's faithfulness. Faithfulness brings forth excellence. Amen. If you show me a faithful man, there's going to be an excellent man. If you show me an unfaithful man, there's no excellence there. So watch what the Word says. But Daniel, Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. Everybody say resolved. Daniel had made up his mind. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to make your mind up. Look at your other neighbor and say, you got to make your mind up too. If Jesus doesn't want us riding on the fence, he says, I, I'd rather you either be hot or cold. Now, that's a big deal. That's a big deal when the Word of God tells us that. He said, I'd rather you be cold and not serving me than walking around with half a heart thinking that you are, and you're just fooling yourself and trying to fool everybody else who probably knows better by now. He says, I either want you hot or I either want you cold. I either want you with me or I want you against me. But I don't want you fooling yourself into thinking that you're living the way you're supposed to be living. In chapter 1, it says Daniel had resolved that he would not defile himself. Daniel had made up his mind that he was going to honor God. 1 Samuel 2.30, God speaking in that text right there. For those who honor me, God says, I will honor. Amen? And so that's huge. That's huge. That, 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 verse, that verse means so much to me. That's why I chose to put it up over my head every time I preach. Because from the very beginning, from the very beginning, I've seen what the hand of God will do if you just say, yes, God, you first. You first. Daniel resolved to put God first. And so look at what it says in the text. Uh, Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food, or with the wine that he drank. Everybody look up here for a moment. You want to know what's wrong with the king's food? The king's food has been used for sacrifice. And it's meat that has been sacrificed to false gods. And this king has brought in the meat that has been sacrificed to false idols. And Daniel says, there's no way I'm going to eat that. And one of the airports that we were in in, uh, in Mexico City, they had these symbols for death. And if you've ever seen the symbol for death, it's not just the normal skull. It's... It's, uh, it's, it's, it's very sh it's shaped in, in, in a different way, but uh, they, they, had the, they had the symbol of death hanging up in different places of the restaurant, and we're looking for a place to eat, and it was the only restaurant in that sector of the airport where you could actually sit down and dine. And I looked at Brother Eric, and, and I said, hey, man, I said, that's one place that we will not be eating in. And he said, yeah, absolutely. I say that to say this. I didn't want to eat anything out of that place that had been prepared from a business or a group of people that were under the influence of the spirit of death. 
You see, Daniel, Daniel's the same way. He says, whoa, 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 whoa. He says, this meat that you want me to eat from the king's table, he says, this meat has been sacrificed to false gods, and I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want anything to do with it. Now listen, essentially what, what Daniel said was this, and this is where we need to be in our lives. If the hand of God's not on it, I don't want it. Listen, it could be a great job, but if it's not the job God has for you, you should want nothing to do with it. Amen? If the hand of God's not on it, you should not want it. Amen? Um, listen, we're, 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 we're coming up on a, on, a, on a political election. All right? Uh, let me just share a little something with you. You should always vote the conviction and the truth of the Bible. And if you're even confused on that, let me just make it even simpler. I don't know how a Christian in their right mind could vote for a person that supports abortion. Now let me just take this a step further. You say, well, come on, Pastor Lee, that's just, that's just, that's just one view that that person had. No, no, no. This is my opinion on that. This is my opinion on that. If a person's way of thinking is so tainted that they think it's okay to kill a child right up to birth. How can I think that any other decision they make will be that of a right mind? <laughs> think about that now. If they think it's okay to kill a child, how can I trust them to make the laws for the land that I live? This is a big deal coming up. This is a really big deal. You say, Pastor Lee, what does this election have to do anything with preaching the word of God today? Everything. Daniel had resolved that he was going to honor God no matter what. And as a Christian people, we must resolve that we are going to honor God no matter what. And to the people that do not want to line up with that, we pray, we pray for the salvation of their souls, but we do not have to get beside them and support the work that they're doing. That's huge. That's huge. Again, if you think it's okay to do that, what else do you think it's okay to do? And someone says, oh, no, 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 you can't, you can't talk politics in your church from the pulpit. No, 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 I've never, I've never listened to that argument. And, and even for the people that do still stand on that argument against me, listen to this. That's one of the, that's one of the laws that Trump null and voided. That law is not even here no more. Praise the Lord for that. And so, yes, we're free in America again to talk politics from the pulpit. And praise God that we've been unhandcuffed, amen? I never put those cuffs on to begin with. Y'all just been coming here for all these years. We must have a resolve of Daniel. That if, it's, if what the king is handing down is not good, then I want nothing to do with that. If what the king is handing down honors God, then I want everything to do with that. If, if doing this in my family brings honor to my father, then we'll do that. But if it brings dishonor, we want nothing to do with it. We recently ordered a pair of uh, basketball shoes from my oldest son online. It was a pair of the, and I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this so none of y'all have to go out there and learn the same mistake I did. It was a pair of the new Kyrie Irvings. When you purchase the new Kyrie Irvings, they come in a shoe box, and on the shoe box is uh, the Illuminati symbol and the satanic symbol on the shoe box. And so this arrives at my house, and I'm like, nah, you're going outside now. <laughs> I, I open the box up and look at the shoe, and he's put the emblem on the back of the shoe. And for people who don't understand what that emblem is, they're going to wear it like it's the coolest thing out there. And they don't understand that they're wearing a satanic symbol on their body. We must be committed not to defile ourselves. You may say, oh, pastor, that's just a symbol. That means nothing. No, 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 no. They created that symbol to mean something. You better be careful how you put that on. Can I go a little deeper? I'm going to anyway. Uh, anybody seen that really evil store called Spirit? Sell Halloween costumes? Hey, did, did you know that that store allows uh, the atheist groups uh, to come into their store for $30,000. They close the store at night when all of us are in bed. 
And the atheists go in there and they pray curses over the children that will wear those costumes. Did you know that? That's true. And so that was on the, somebody help me out. Uh, what's, the, what's the place down at Virginia Beach? 700 Club. That was aired on the 700 Club that the Halloween costume store Spirit has sold out for just a low cost of $30,000. And they allow witches and atheists and demonic followers to come in and pray curses all over the costume. But it's just a costume! Maybe to you. But to someone who really believes in the demonic warfare, it's real. Daniel was opposite of that. Daniel said, I have resolved to commit myself unto the Lord. Now look at the text. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel resolved that he would not, what's the next word? Defile who? His neighbor? No, his what? Himself. Look at your neighbor and say, worry about yourself. <laughs> hey, Ray. Raise your hand in here. Raise, raise your hand in here if you're worried about somebody else before yourself. Right? Look at everybody else lying. <laughs> he wouldn't have had to put... Look. Daniel had resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. And therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him, what? Not to defile himself. He says, hey, chief, I don't want anything to do with this, man, because this is not bringing glory to my father. Yeah. Watch verse 9. Because of, because of the resolve and the desire that Daniel had, verse 9 says this, and God gave Daniel what? Favor and what? Compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. See, don't be worried about other people because God can change those people's view about you. You understand? Somebody could be attacking you, and God could make it so they just leave you alone. You understand? Uh, I got to meet a gentleman who uh, used to drive, or he may still drive a bus, for, for a church and a ministry downtown in Richmond. He pulled the school bus into the uh, parking lot late at night to fuel up after he had dropped everyone from the church home. They picked ch children up in the school bus to take them to church. And while he's fueling his bus up, and then, now the man who this happened to told me this, while they were fueling the bus up, a guy comes up to rob him, and he's got a knife in his hand, and he says, hey, give me all your money right now, or I'll kill you. And the guy looks around, and there's nobody there. The gas station's closed. It's late at night. He's just paying with his car through the machine, and immediately, how many of you know that the Scripture says, where, 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 where God says, I will give you what you need to know in the exact hour? You just thankful for that? The Christian looks at the man as he's got a knife held right at his stomach. And he looks at that man and he says, you know, he said, you, you could kill me. He says, but if you kill me, I know I'm going to heaven. He says, but let's say we wrestle over that knife. And by some accident, you get stabbed. If you die tonight, are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? He said, the man had the knife and he took it and looked at him, scared straight. He turned and ran down the road. What a resolve. That brother had made his decision that no matter where he stood in life, it was always going to be about Jesus Christ. That no matter where he stood in life, he was always going to turn the subject back to God. He was always going to turn the point of view back to God. He was always going to bring the people back to God. And when, and when we have that type of resolve to bring it back centered to God, God blesses it. It says right there in the, in the first chapter of Daniel that God saw the resolve that Daniel had and he gave him favor and what church? Compassion. He allowed him to be set up at the top of the kingdom over that king. Now, I want to I take you somewhere else uh, quickly in Scripture. Go to, go to 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to begin uh, in just a moment with the 14th verse. 1 Peter chapter 1.
God is good. Amen? Praise the Lord. You know, it said that God had, uh, or that Daniel, rather, excuse me, Daniel had resolved uh, not to defile himself. I, I want to tell you, if you do not know already, what, what the word defile means. Defile means to make dirty or unclean. Everybody say sin. Right? And so basically, this is the job of sin. It is to separate us from God. That's what happens when we commit sin. The, the job of sin is to separate us from God. Ultimately, Scripture says, ultimately, that sin, when it is given birth, it leads to death. And so we need to, as much as we can, stay away from sin. When we commit sin and we slip up and we choose sin, praise God for repentance. Amen. And it must happen quickly. But the longer we wait, the more we risk of our hearts becoming hardened. So defile means to make dirty or unclean. God doesn't want his people dirty or unclean. Let's take a look at this. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning with the 14th, 14th verse. 1 Peter 1, 14. God's word says this, praise the Lord. As what, church? Obedient children. All right, now we're going to read this out loud. Look at the screen, if you will, or, or from your Bibles. But on the count of three, we're going to read this verse out loud until I say stop. Ready? One, two, three, go. Stop right there. Stop right there. As obedient, what? Children. Okay? I mean, this is, this is really good, and we just need to... We just need to really just chew on this for, for a moment. Um, as obedient children, do not be conformed, okay? So look at your neighbor and say, that's talking about me and you, right? As obedient children, do not be conformed. I don't want you thinking just because it says children, it's talking about somebody under 17 years of age. No, even when your child gets to be 50 years old, that's still going to be your baby. Amen. Amen? And so as... God, looking down on his creation, we are always his children. Amen? So look at the 14th verse. As obedient children, do not be... So now we know it's talking to us. Now watch this. We are not to be what? Conformed to the what? Passions. Well, what passion is it talking about? Our former ignorance. All right. Ignorance means not knowing better. And So in other words, that's saying don't act the way you did now that you're saved before you got saved. Don't act like that before you were in ignorance, but now you know better. Amen? They say, now you know better. And so he's writing this letter to the church, but ultimately it's to the entirety of the church. We still grow from this letter. Amen? And he says, don't act the way that you did before you got saved. You're saved. There's supposed to be something different about you. And that's the problem. That's a large problem with a big part of the church in the world today is that the church still looks like the world, and when the unsaved sees the church that's supposed to be saved, and there is no difference, and they figure, well, why in the world should I put all that time, effort, and energy into that when it makes no difference? You understand? There should be a difference in your life, so much so that your neighbors know about it. Not because you post up signs in the front yard that says, I'm a changed neighbor. Not because you run over there on a Saturday morning and you're washing their vehicle for them. Just in your interaction alone. You understand? You understand? And so look at what the text says. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. All right, so now we know better. Verse 15, but as he who called you is holy, now here's a command, but as he who called you is holy, you also be what? Holy. Wow. Now this is what, this is what I love about, about my heavenly father. When God sent Jesus to save me, he didn't expect me to be holy by myself, but by what Jesus did for me, I now become holy. Now, as long as I'm remaining in Christ and I'm in step with the Spirit, I can be holy. Amen? It's when I follow the desires and passions of my flesh and I follow through on that ugliness that I become unholy, and now we have a problem. Amen? Now, now I love it when the Word is just right there in front of us. Look at it. Uh, verse 15. But as... He who called you is holy. You also be holy in how much of your life? All your what? Conduct. Okay, so that's everything that you do. Amen? We're to be holy in everything that we do. Not just when we come to church. Amen? Not just on the way to church. Not just on the way home from church. 
Not just on Sunday mornings or Sunday evenings, not just Saturday nights because you're trying to pull it together to look like church again, right? Right? Uh-oh. We're going to church in the morning? Yeah, we're going. Oh, man. We're dealing with some stuff here, right? I mean, just... But really, when we go to not act right, church should be, excuse me, church should be the go-to place, Right? Right? You know, uh, anybody ever watched boxing before? Right? Um, they have this thing called a corner, and in the corner there's a man called a cut man, and every time the boxer gets messed up, he needs to go to the cut man because the cut man can save him from being disqualified from the fight. See, church is that corner for us. No matter what, go, what we go through in our week, this is a safe place. No matter what we go through, we come here to be prepared. No matter how we act, no matter uh, how ugly we get during the week, this should be the place that we come to to get bandaged up, to get charged up, to get refreshed up, and to have someone in our corner that says, go back out there, you can do it again. And this is what church should be. This is what church should be. Church should be a place where the hurt comes to and they go out better. That should be church. We notice Jesus says that, uh, you know, he, he didn't just come for the healthy. He came for the who? He came for the sick. And all of us got sick friends. All of us got messed up friends. Raise your hand if you got a messed up friend, right? Yeah. This should be the place that we're inviting those messed up people to. Every one of us in here, saved or not, to a degree, we, we're messed up too. We've got things that we're going through that we're asking God to refine, that we're asking God to, to change and to make us look more like him. Amen? So look at what the verse says in verse 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am what, church? He says, for I am holy. I mean, that's amazing. See, Daniel had favor and compassion from God because he had a resolve not to defile himself. And this is what I'm telling you. This is what I'm telling you this morning. That we can still, by not having that sin in our lives, it allows us to continue to draw closer to the Heavenly Father. Amen? By, by, having, by having a desire to not be defiled, we have a desire to walk in the sanctification. And that should be the goal, really, that every single one of us have. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. Let me show you this. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm just really trusting that this is going to bless you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and look at the 23rd verse. This is beautiful right here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. When you're there, say, I'm ready to grow. Amen. Let's do it together by the power of the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now, may the God of peace himself, what? Remember, Daniel was resolved not to defile himself, which means he wanted to be sanctified by the hand of God. I want to be set apart. All right, so we know defile. We know defile means to make dirty or unclean. So what is, what is it to be sanctified? Sanctified is to be set apart for the glory of God. So I want to be set apart to be used. How many people want to be used by the hand of God? It's so fun, man. It's so fun. I mean, you saw the pictures of, that, of those people in the airport. I mean, you talk about getting... True joy, true joy by being able to lead a lost soul into salvation. I mean, truth is so fun being used by the hand of God. Allowing yourself to be set apart for his kingdom. That's sanctified. That's sanctification right there. That I'm choosing to no longer live like the old me. I'm going to cut that. I'm going to sever that. I'm going to get that off of me. And I'm going to live like the new creature in Christ Jesus that he's called me to be. I've got to let go of a lot of things. But listen, here's the good news is if you can say that this morning. I've got to let go of a lot of things. Listen to this. You don't have to do it by yourself. The hand of God will do it for you. You just have to be willing to let God do it. Amen? And say, this is the beauty of sanctification. You and I cannot sanctify ourselves. Amen? 
We cannot sanctify ourselves. So it's not something that you have to work towards. It's not something that you have to conjure up. It's not something that you've got to make three easy payments of $19.99 on either. You don't have to send in for some towel that costs $30 that was drug across something or water dipped down onto it. You don't have to do any of that. If you want to be sanctified, then you be resolved today that you live for God. There it is. You just resolve today that you're going to live for God and he will show you favor and he will show you compassion just like he did our brother Daniel. You understand? He had a resolve not to defile himself. He had, a, he had a resolve not to defile himself and to be sanctified. And so sanctified again is being set apart for the use of God's hand. And so watch what happens here. Verse 23 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now, may the God of peace himself. So we're talking about God doing an action to us. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you just a little bit. No. Sanctify you just on Sundays. No. Sanctify you just when Pastor Lee's over? No. Uh, sanctify you completely. Hmm. Let me tell you what that means. Uh, that's a complete life change. When you're sanctified completely, that means every area of your life you're going to let God work in. At your job, at your home, in your marriage, with your children, with your parents, with your grandparents, with strangers. It means this. Every second, every moment of every day, of every month, of every year, you're in line to work for the Father. And will we get pushed out of line? Will we kick ourselves out of line? Yeah, we will sometimes. We're in a fallen world, and we live in this flesh suit. But we've got to have our vision straight so that when we get out, we know we've got to get right back in through repent of heart. I'm so glad that every time we get out, God lets us come right back in. Amen? He lets us come right back in. And you, you, know, you know the beauty of God? When you get out of line, I'm so thankful that he doesn't make you go all the way to the back of the line. Amen? Could you imagine as a Christian, every time you messed up, you had to start back over? I mean, that'd be miserable, wouldn't it? It'd be miserable. So look at what the text says. Verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, lowercase s, so is that yours or God's? That's yours, that's mine. May our whole spirit and soul and body be kept, what? Blameless. Everything in us, my soul, my spirit, my body must be kept blameless. I cannot allow myself to be defiled. I must choose to be sanctified by the blood of Jesus, and walk in the calling and the obedience of God. That's a life choice that we have to make as individuals. I'm going to choose to be used by God no matter where I am. No matter where I am. Just imagine how much the world would change if every Christian had that resolve to be used no matter where they were. No matter where they were. So it says here in verse 23 that our whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, he, that's God, he who calls you is what? Faithful. And he will surely what? Do it. If your heart, if your heart this morning is resolved to be set apart for the work of the Lord, he'll do it according to the text. He'll put you in front of people on an airplane that need to be saved. He'll put you around people that are hurting and you have the answer through prayer. He'll put you around people that have a testimony similar to yours so that they could say, this has to be God. This has to be God. You know that young lady Ashley I showed you a picture of? I told you her grandmother raised her uh, because her parents, her mom was on drugs and she called her grandmother Mimi she said that the only time, Ashley said this, Ashley said that the only time she went to church was when her Mimi took her to church. Ashley hadn't been in a while, and I said, well, let me tell you something. This was after she received Jesus. I said, Ashley, I can guarantee you this. Your Mimi has been praying for your salvation your entire life. I said, I know it's late. We got off the plane, and we're walking in the airport. We're getting ready to separate. I said, if we never see each other again, she lives in King William, and... Uh, she may be watching the service uh, when, we, when we put it online. But when, uh, 
when we, when we separated in the airport, I said, if we don't see each other get on this earth, we'll go see each other get in heaven. I know it's late, but you need to call your Mimi now. I said, because uh, she'll probably wake up fearful that something bad has happened. But you're going to give her the news of her life that the granddaughter that she raised has come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. I mean, it's, it's amazing, you know. It's just so amazing when you just let go and let God do it. it says, now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. I want you, I want you to know that word in verse 23. Completely. That's everything. That, that, that we're to be sanctified, set apart for God everywhere, every moment, with every friend, in every circle, at every job, at every moment, with every neighbor, with every team matter what you're doing in your life, be willing to let God use you. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, please. Just back up a page or so. And I want you to look at the third verse for me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. Now watch this. This, this, is, this is good stuff right here. How many people in here want to know what the will of God is for your life? I mean, yeah, absolutely. Every one of us should, should have a desire. All right, let's, let's take a look. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with the, the third verse. The Word of God says this. Everybody read it out loud on the count of three. One, two, three, go. Stop right there. You guys are real good at doing that, I tell you. Now this excites me. How many people have opened up a, gone to open up a present before and you really had no idea what was on the inside? Anybody? And you're just so excited. I mean, that's the one that you want to open, you know, because maybe he or she normally doesn't buy you presents, but this is the year that they slipped up and did something good, right? They just slipped up and did something romantic, you know, and like, oh, he finally bought something for me. Or she finally bought something for me. This is about to be so good. You just feel good because you know something good's getting ready to come out the box. Now watch this. This is the will of God for you and for me and for this church and for every person on the face of this planet. This is the will of God. Verse 3. For this is the will of God, your what? Sanctification. So glad God does not expect you and me to be perfect by ourselves because we fail at it miserably, wouldn't we? But whether we fail or whether we're successful, it doesn't change that it's the will of God. You understand? He wants you to be sanctified. He says, be holy because I'm holy. Because I'm holy, you should be holy. Be holy for I'm holy. This is the will of God. Verse 3, look at it again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, your what? Your sanctification. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. But he does, he, this is what I love about God. He, he doesn't just leave us hanging there. He goes much further in it. He says, verse 3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control Hear that. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. You see, I'm so thankful that God just, he just doesn't leave us hanging wondering what we're supposed to do. But he tells us very plainly what we're supposed to do as Christians. And if you're here and, and you've not been resolved to follow Jesus, but you feel convicted today, to serve him with everything that you have. Let me encourage you that God is, he's accepting that. He's accepting that desire and he will transform your life. Maybe there's some people that just feel like the town you grew up in has always just been so small that you don't feel like you'll ever be used in amazing ways by God's hand. No, 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 I'm nobody special. But my father is. And when you're willing to say whatever he asks you to say and do whatever he wants you to do, you will find yourself in some of the most peculiar spaces. And 
will always be to honor him and for his glory. And that's all he's looking for. He's looking for someone that has allowed him to take them into his hand, to brush them off, make them clean, redeem them to salvation. Looking for someone that will spend time in his word, time in listening, time in praying, and then more time listening. Looking for a people that will worship him and praise him and honor him so that as he trains them up, he knows this is the vessel that I can blow forth by my spirit anywhere all over the world. Anywhere all over the world. God says through His Word here that we should abstain from sexual immorality. Verse 4, that each, of, each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. That takes resolve. That takes wanting to do better. Amen? How many people here want to do better? I know I want to do better. That takes wanting to do better and listen, then actually doing something about it. Doing something about it. Actually doing something about it. You remember when the brother was uh, worshiping and later on he had fallen asleep and he had been put in jail for teaching in the name of Jesus and an angel comes up to him and strikes him on the side. And he wakes up and he looks and the angel of the Lord had told him, get up, put your sandals on your feet come follow me. It says that for a moment he's coming and he thought that maybe it was a dream or a vision the text says. But then as the gates and the doors flew open and he walked through unhindered it says he realized that this was really happening. One day the Holy Spirit showed me this and it just amazed me. The angel was willing to open the doors. The angels, the angel was willing to remove his shackles that was holding him back from leaving. The angel was willing to release the gate to the prison and set him free. But he still told the man something. He said, put your shoes on your feet. What God showed me from that was this. You do what you can do and let God do what you can't do. But what we cannot do is expect that God should do everything because there's no faithfulness on our part in that is there we should do what we can do what had happened what would it have looked like if the angel came and went ahead and put the put the little shoes on the man's feet for him he said hey I've, I've done the hard work but you show your faith put your shoes on rise up come with me Jesus speaks the same way. He says, if anybody should come after me, he says, they're going to have to pick up their cross and they're going to have to follow me. Jesus taught the exact same thing. Jesus taught this life is not going to be easy following me. But it is the only way to eternity with the Father. It is the only way to eternity with the Father. And Jesus' teaching was this. You must lay down your life and pick up mine. You must lay down your mind. You must lay down your way of thinking and pick up the mind and the thoughts of Christ. Those are the thoughts that will lead us into eternal life. Those are the thoughts that will lead us away from temptation. But when we start thinking like us, it leads us into problems. Sooner or later, we're going to leave our resolve. We're going to go right back to thinking how we were before we were saved. We'll be living in the flesh again, not walking in the spirit, looking to please ourselves because we've deserved it after all. Nothing but a lie from the enemy, a lie from the evil one. So he says, each of you, verse 4, that each of one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. 
that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you now. See, it says the Lord is the avenger. This is why the word of God can tell us to love our enemies. Because it's not up to us to reap that justice. We should love our enemies in hopes that God would do a work through them so that they too should get saved. But if the Christian, if the church is throwing arrows at the unsaved, what good is that? What good is that? But we should continue to love them. And see, that was the problem that Jonah had with Nineveh. Uh, rather than love them, I hate them. God, I know you want to save them, but I hate them. You cannot live like that, church. So then it says this, if you look at verse 7, for God has not called us for what? Impurity. Look at that now, verse 7. God has not called us for impurity. He's not called us to live defiled. He's not called us to live in sin. He's called us to be sanctified. So it says in verse 7, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. So we've been called in holiness. Therefore, Watch this, verse 8. Therefore, whoever, whoever, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. See, you can go home and you can take this message and throw it in the trash. That's not hurting my feelings. But according to the word of God, it's definitely hurting his says right there whoever disregards this disregards not man but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you let's stand and pray father what do we do with this what do we do with this message what do we do with this text what do, you, what do we do with the verses and the scriptures from the chapters that we study what do we do with it I pray in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ that every one of us would have a resolve to serve you faithfully that every one of us, every one of us would have a desire and a heart cry to do whatever it takes that we no longer walk in the sin and the things that defile us and make us unclean and dirty that try to separate us from you and try to lead us into death. So Father, I pray that we would ever be listening, always being willing to be obedient, always willing to walk in your spirit always willing to do what you call us to do. I pray that our hearts would change, Father, where they need to be changed. God, I pray that you would show us the error of our ways. Maybe there's some of us here that just don't understand what's been going wrong. Maybe we think it's okay. God, I pray that you would show us every single sector in our lives that we've not fully sanctified, that we've not allowed you to take over, that we've not allowed you to take control of, that we've not allowed you to work in. God, I pray for every area in our lives where we've shut the door, that you would reveal to us those areas that we think are ours. And really that selfish thinking, that selfish living, and that sin, that sin, that sin. So, Father, I pray that we would be committed to surrendering to you. And right now, right now, for anyone in this room, that has never asked Jesus to save your soul and you've got a desire to do that today. You've got a desire to ask Jesus to come into your life. You've got a desire to ask Jesus to save your soul so that you do not have to go to hell, but you will go into heaven for all of eternity. The Bible says that no one comes to the Father except through the Son. That's Jesus Christ. So there is no other way. There's a lot of religions. There's a lot of a lot of crazy things going on in today's world. But it doesn't change the fact that there's still one truth. And that's Jesus. And that's the work that he did for every one of us on the cross. So if you're here today and you're ready to surrender to God. And you're ready to accept Jesus as your Savior. You're ready to live a brand new life. I welcome you right where you are. Just raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. Anybody here ready for that? Anybody here ready to just start over? Anybody here ready to say, Lord, I'm tired of doing this thing by myself. I'm tired of it. Anybody here feel like they're at the end of the road? And they just want 
to let Jesus get to reset start all over. you're here today and you want to just kind of hit the reset button in your own life you want to go back to just that day that you had with Jesus to where you were just willing to listen all the time for his spirit's call that day where you were just willing to do whatever 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 he asked of you just had boldness or maybe you're here today and you want that new boldness maybe that's you and I'm going to invite you to come forward right now. We're just going to take a moment to pray. If you want the hand of God to work in your life, I invite you to come forward right now. If you want the hand of God to use you all over this place, I just want, want you to come forward. We're going to pray for you. If you're willing to just step out and let God use you in the grocery store, at the gas station, at your office, at work, in the printing room, wherever, it doesn't matter, wherever. If you're just willing to let God use you in your family, I want you to come forward. I want to pray with you. If you're willing to just surrender and you want to have a heart, you want to have a resolve to just let God move mightily, mightily, mightily in your life. I'm going to invite you to come forward because only God can do that. Only God can do that. Father, you see every person that's up here. You see every person that's willing to come forth and take a stand. Every person that's hungry, hungry to have a resolve to live for you every moment, every second, every day of their lives. And so, God, I pray that you, Father, would continue to speak to them, that you would continue to convict them, that you would continue, Father, to work and take them from faith to faith, that they would continue, Father, to read your word like they never have before. Give them a hunger, and I pray that, God, I pray that in the name of Jesus, that they would have a hunger and an intensity for more of your word in their lives like they've never had ever before, Father. And if they've walked away from that first love they had, may this be the moment that they come back. May this be it. And I pray, Father, that your hand would be evident in their lives, that your voice would be heard clear, and that you would give them the strength to overcome every obstacle as they step forth in boldness. Prepare every way and open and shut every door that needs to be opened and closed. In Jesus' name and blood, we pray all these things. Excited, truly excited about seeing the fruit of the work. In Jesus' name, everybody said together, church. Amen and amen.